in idea some features related to use of artificial intelligence in analytics have been incorporated and more solutions sections features will be added or are in the offing we know, do know that there are a lot of developments happening on the ground in canada and it will be available to the internal auditing fraternity the external auditing fraternity soon in the coming months and years we as internal auditors and external auditors will need to adopt such technology now jeffrey sorensen as some of you heard in the beginning is not new to india because he was in india 3 months back 2 and a half months back and he has interacted with a number of chief audit executives uh about jeffrey he is industry strategist at caseware analytics he joined caseware analytics in august 2016 as product manager for their flagship product which is idea the idea solution he is a certified instructor in consulting and i think his his achievements go on like he has been in the it industry he has spent 20 years uh, so i think we have circulated that to everyone i will not get into the details but a very competent a very good human being highly skilled so i think we are very lucky to have him early in the morning is got up to do a live presentation to all of us so i think with this i'll request jeffrey to take over jeff please oh thank you very much for that uh, introduction to deep yes i was in india uh, a few months ago and uh, really loved it it was really uh, an eye opening and, and a great experience good to see the the sama team um, always happy to help when i can All right, so let's get started here. So you should see uh, the slide change, okay? Yeah, so here we go. Um, session is um, really about idea and artificial intelligence. It's a it's a quick session. Uh, this is me. We don't going to keep on. I think we've got the intro down already. Um, this is going to be a lot of demo, uh, but I do have a little bit of um, theory. I just want to talk about before I dive right into the demo, just because it's important to know, you know. Uh, what I'm going to demo, what that really is, and where that fits on the whole continuum of uh, artificial intelligence, because there's so much talk about it out there today, and it's kind of good to have a sense for where this fits in, what it'll do, what it won't do, um, and then you can see how it fits. So basically, I'm going to talk a bit about uh, artificial intelligence as it is right now, as it's defined, and it turns out it's actually difficult to come up with a definition which you wouldn't think you would think it would be very straightforward to, to say what it is but i'll explain what why that is uh i'll talk about uh, some of the different types and where this demo will fit in and then we're going to dive right into a demo uh machine learning demo in idea uh i have three different data files i don't know how many we have the time for we'll definitely do one in detail and have a couple others so let's see how much we can get done Um, we also want to uh, just very quickly. There's going to be a slide on a bit about how you can get started, like how you can apply these lessons today uh, in your own audits uh, right away. So that's going to be good. And then we want to have time for some Q and A. I understand that you know you guys do want to to inquire, ask how things work, and I want to hopefully leave some time for that. So let's get started. Um, So when we define artificial intelligence right now, there are actually many definitions. If you look online and you want to try to find one, it used to be called machine intelligence, but nobody really uses that term anymore. But artificial intelligence, I'm going to use one, which I thought was probably the best definition I could find, and, and I'm going to read it very quickly. But AI is the branch of computer science concerned with the automation of intelligent behavior. Intelligence is the computational ability to achieve goals in the world. Very high level, right? Like this is not uh, that specific. And the reason why, so there's really two aspects of this definition that are important. Automation is very important, and you're going to see that automation is really a big part of why you would do this. Uh, you're trying to automate a task, uh, and intelligent, of course. So intelligence uh, is really when we look at the definition we say automation of activity associated with human thinking so intelligence being things that people are typically better at uh, or that only people can do so decision making would be one uh, to solve problems and to learn so those are three areas where we want to be able to automate that kind of activity so it's pretty broad right so so the the reason why the ai definition is what it is is because 
uh, the guard posts, uh, the, uh, the goal posts keep shifting. You know, what used to be difficult um, would be considered artificial intelligence, but when that has been cracked and that has been solved, people just see it as normal. Look at translation software online. If you look at something like Google Translate, um, it's not perfect by any means, but over the last, I would say, five years, it has become much, much better. Uh, due to a lot of artificial intelligence um, that it has just been able to learn from so much writing. And we're going to get into how they do that in just a second. So yes, AI is about creating machines that do things people are historically better at doing um, these kinds of things. So we're going to get into what that means. All right. So what the demo we're doing is a machine learning demo, and there's really two flavors of it. But a Machine learning at a very high level, it's a subset of artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence being the main concept, and within that concept, there would be machine learning as one of the big items. Uh, machine learning algorithms, they basically create a statistical model, and instead of having a bunch of hard-coded sentences, so for instance, if this field equals 201, then go here, they don't do that. They use a sample data file to figure out what should happen next. All right, so you can kind of call it like a dynamic learning, if you will. Uh, so it's not uh, an expert system that would have hard-coded rules that say, you know, go here under this, you don't have to code that. It uses the data itself to teach it what to do. Uh, so they call that training data. So the idea is uh, it will make, based on statistics, it will make predictions without specific programming instructions, right? So there's two flavors of machine learning. So there's what's called supervised machine learning, which is where human beings are part of the process. So what it does is you have a data file, could be transactions, you feed the transaction file to the machine learning algorithm, it does its best guess based on what it sees in the file, it tries to learn from, from reading the file and figuring out what were the patterns are and tries to predict these transactions are acceptable these are not acceptable or these are outliers and these are inliers so it tries to do that and then with supervised machine learning part of the process is there is a human feedback loop so we human beings actually have to look at what it did and grade it and mark it to say this was correct yes you said it's an outlier it is an outlier correct this one you said it was an outlier but it's not x you got this wrong Others, you say, we're not outliers. It turns out they are. You got that wrong. So human beings have to actually manually flag what, what it did and then feed it back into the machine. And then next time it looks at that file, hopefully it gets, I'm going to say in quotation marks, smarter. Um, so it's, it's a, a pretty uh, a labor-intensive way to do it. Um, on the Internet, have you ever experienced it where you're trying to open something and it shows you a bunch of pictures and says, identify the traffic lights, and you have to sit and click? And you have to say, uh, look at a picture and identify where there's traffic lights? Well, it's kind of that idea that, you know, uh, the computer guesses and you have to sort of confirm if it's right or not. That's supervised machine learning I've been talking about. So unsupervised machine learning is basically where you don't have the last part. So there's no human feedback loop. It goes through the file. It takes its best guess based on what it sees in the file. So it's teaching itself based on the other transactions. And then it says, okay, based on what I'm seeing in this file, these look like outliers. And that's as far as it goes. So that's unsupervised. It does its own um, uh, calculations and does it without human feedback. So um, at at sort of, um, if you look at a, at a global scale, um, and I want to see, what, yeah, that's good. Uh, what people are using artificial intelligence for are they want higher productivity, they want faster work, they want more consistent work so that it can find things and we don't, doesn't forget to do all the steps. It's higher quality work. It sees what humans cannot. So. Uh, there are times when uh, artificial intelligence, because it can look at millions and billions of transactions, it can find patterns that human beings just wouldn't be able to do. And it can therefore also predict what humans cannot. Because it can, has this enormous scope um, and it has these statistical calculations that it can do over such large timeframes, 
it can make predictions that we wouldn't be able to do. And then, of course, in some cases, it's actually doing part of the work for us. So this all sounds good, right? Artificial intelligence, wow, you're thinking, you know, maybe I, I don't, you don't need all these auditors anymore. Well, that's certainly not the case because there are some very huge and very real challenges that we do not have any solutions for today. Think about this. You heard about this, the supervised uh, machine learning. What if we don't have good training data? And this is actually a real problem. And most companies have this problem is that they may have data, but um, what if we just don't have the time to supervise all of these results, to go through all the reactions and figure out what the computer has done right or done wrong? Maybe the data itself um, is biased, right? Uh, there's an example with um, Apple, actually, uh, makers of the iPhone created a credit card and uh, they had an automatic credit approval process based on, I don't know if it's a machine learning, but it was based on historical data. And there was a husband and wife uh, that who both worked in the same company and had the same type of job. And they both applied for credit cards and the husband got a $20,000 more in credit limit than the wife. So they asked the question, why? What is the difference? We make the same money, we work in the same company, we live in the same address, why is there such a disparity? So that's the problem with our data. When we use data as a training model, if we have past injustices and biases and um, inequities, those will perpetuate themselves in the future. So uh, it's very tricky to have good training data in most businesses. Also, the final thing about intelligence right now is that it may be fine with one particular deep, very narrow application. So it might be able to detect a certain type of outlier, or it might be able to translate a particular file, but it's not general intelligence, right? That it cannot do two different things and put two different things together. Whereas human beings can handle many different thoughts in the brain and connect the two. A computer cannot do that. They are all built, purpose built for one function only, uh, and they do not cross over. And that makes them very limited. Right, and we see that with things like self-driving cars, how they really struggle in the real world to, to get around. So most audit shops, in reality, are going to use unsupervised machine learning. Uh, so they don't run into this problem, is that how do you give it, uh, how do you train it? How do you know what biases are in this data? You're gonna simply run it, you're gonna see what it comes up with, and the human being is gonna figure out what to do with it. Which means auditors are absolutely critical in the process, because this cannot run on its own. So let's start getting into a machine learning demo here. So what I'm going to just switch over. So I have idea open here. You should all be able to see idea right now. Okay. So um, I have an example now. Let's just see uh, if I had that in here. I'm going to check one thing out. Uh, just one thing I want to do before I, I get cracking on the demo. Uh, I'm going to go one more thing. Okay, perfect. So uh, let's take a file. So what we're gonna do is, this is gonna be, I'm gonna enlarge this a little bit, make it a little easy to read. So this is a payroll example. So let's say we are performing an audit of a payroll application. And uh, one of the tests we have is we want to make sure that people are not underpaid in their respective territory because there could be laws that you are uh, violating. Maybe you're not paying a minimum wage. Uh, maybe it's a pay equity issue. Someone's paid more than, than, uh, than someone else. Uh, so we want to be able to know that we are not underpaying people. Uh, we also probably want to know if someone's overpaid. So let's say uh, there is uh, nepotism uh, or possibly some sort of corruption that let's say someone's related to someone and they get a huge amount more money than the rest of the similar uh, employees in a similar role. So how do we deal with that issue? Well, um, we could do things like minimum, maximum, but the problem is this particular file, you have employees from four different countries. So what is minimum wage in US dollars may not be the same as a minimum wage in, Mex in pesos. So it's a bit of a problem. So you just think about that for a second. How would you actually have a file with all these employees of all the different countries, how would you really do that? If you had to do this in your job, you had this file and you want to, to be able to 
within each country, within each branch, know whether the pay is reasonable or whether there are any outliers in the pay? Well, we're going to use something called Outliers. It's a machine learning uh, app that you can download from Idealab, and it's called Outliers. So what Outliers is going to do is it's going to use unsupervised machine learning, and it's going to try to look for outliers in our data. So if you look at this, so what we need to select are categories. So in other words, are there particular um, types of fields that we want to analyze? And then there, of course, there is a salary, which is a numeric. So what categories are we interested in in this case? Well, I think we do want to know because maybe each branch is in a different address. Maybe one is New York City. Maybe the other one is out in Idaho somewhere. Well, people get paid more in New York City than they do in Idaho. So the wages should adjust. So we want to use the branch. So what we'll do is we'd select the branch as a category that we're interested in. We, of course, we need the country because the, you know, the salary will be different uh, for each territory. And then finally, we do need the currency code because we want to know, it's clearly it's very important to know whether this is 67,000 pesos or whether it's US dollars. So these are the three categories we're interested in. Within the branch, within the country, within that currency, is the salary reasonable? So we're gonna click salary, numeric, there we go. So within branch, country, currency, is the salary reasonable? So you can decide how deep a scan you perform. So uh, the deeper the scan, the more detailed it goes. Level five is the absolute most outliers. I always start with the lowest, with, with level one scan, meaning that you cast a very small net and you look at your transactions and see if they all check out as real outliers, if they're all perfect or they're all outliers that and they, it detected them correctly, then I would cast the white net a little wider to a level two and it'll include some more. And then once you get to the stage when you can say, all right, now um, we're starting to get some, uh, some false positives, you're starting to get some that are not really a problem, you stop. So it's kind of like we do in audit within sampling, right? When we sample transactions, right, we start with 10 or 20, we look at them, and if we find you know, something interesting, we might do some more. So it's the same concept. So when I click, so it's gonna run. Screen will blink a little bit. It will only take a few seconds. Um, but what it's gonna do is it's gonna use, there's three different algorithms that it's gonna use. Uh, it's gonna grind through all the transactions. It is going to subject them to different um, algorithms. Um, it's going to subject them to different ways of finding outliers. So I'm going to just zoom in because it's a little bit small here. Um, so what it does, it gives you two files when you're done. So the first file is a summary file. So it's going to show you, first of all, all the inliers. So it said basically about 98% of the of the, of the data file is is fine, like really seem normal. But they're in, high, in the highest risk order there are some outliers you should be aware of. So an outlier two is where two algorithms both thought it was an outlier. So there's one transaction and the category is upper limit exception. So let's just see what that is. So we click on it and it's gonna say, okay, so we found one. There's uh, in branch three in China, uh, there is a salary of 900,000, all right? Now this is an interesting, this outlier reason is something that we do, uh, our particular outliers program does, which is not something you're gonna see uh, others do we have an outlier reason. So I would always start with the outlier reason and then see what the, so the reason in this case, it says, look, 900,000 is a, a larger salary than we thought 780,000 should be the max based on all the records I'm seeing. So it's using learning. It's going through the file and it's learning what salaries ought to be like. And the very highest ones are outliers and it, and it puts them in a special bucket. So it says, this one seems, this is an upper limit exception because 900,000 is, is the highest, really, right? Higher than what it thought the, the max should be. So I think it got that one correct. This one is a category of data integrity unusual. Now, this one I think is fascinating. Well, let's look at this one. So in this example, let's look at their explanation. So it says, this is an outlier because currency equals China. Okay, that doesn't seem to make sense. Why would that be a problem? We have Chinese employees here. But can anyone see what the problem is here? country Mexico, currency China. See, this is something that we didn't have to ask for, right? The algorithm looked 
and used its intelligence and used its learning capability to say, wait a minute, when I normally look at people with the currency of China, they always come from the country China, but this one comes from a different country. This is an outlier. So you can see it's not just looking at minimum, maximum. It's not just looking for, you know, what are the, 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 the peak amounts. That would be very easy to do. This can go deeper. This can look for relationships that don't make sense. And it's interesting because this particular file is something, uh, it's, it's a test file that we created many, many years ago. And uh, we weren't aware that this was uh, an issue in this file. Uh, we actually probably would, we probably created the, text, the, the data files in Excel and probably accidentally copied and pasted uh, this currency once too many. And it wasn't until we started doing our own work with uh, machine learning that we found this error at all. So you can imagine what you could find in your data, right? If you run this on a vendor file, maybe, you could maybe find a vendor has been added to the wrong postal code. Maybe they're in the wrong category. Uh, there are lots of things that you're probably not looking for in your audits right now. So who knows what you'll find, but I, I do think it's interesting. And of course, another upper limit exception would be this one is, you know, 890,000, also a very large salary. All right. So um, let me show you, I think we have time for another example. So let me do, is that okay, uh, Dipti, we can get another example in? Sure, sure. You can positively get another example. All right. So let's do this one. Okay, good, yeah. good. Uh, okay, so I have another example here. So these are uh, payments uh, made to vendors that we have suppliers, right? And we are paying them. And uh, we are sort of interested because in this application, um, we're interested in the people and the controls we have and whether they are abiding by the company standards. So in this example, we have someone posting a transaction to a supplier. Supplier name is here. Uh, there are invoices that are being paid. And this is the person authorizing it. And of course, this is the amount they're authorizing it. So we want to try to use machine learning on a different file. Let's try to open this one here. So what we want to know is um, the people who are posting and the people who are authorizing these files, is there anything unusual in who tends to be uh, settling with which suppliers? Or is anyone beholden to any particular supplier? Is there any maybe untoward relationships between our employees and suppliers? So we're going to try to this time use machine learning to look for that. So I'm just going to clear this so we can see it. So what we really want to know is, okay, we're interested in the people really, right? And what they're doing. So we're going to say posted by, and we want to know, of course, who's authorizing this, right? Um, and then of course we want to know, is a particular vendor, which vendor are they involved with? So we're going to use supplier name. And then, of course, we want to look at the amount, the amount in question, right, as in numeric. You can see how, how easy this is to do. Uh, this time, I'm going to do a level two scan. I want to just say, cast the net a little wider. Uh, so just so you can see how that works. So basically, I'm going to run this. It's going to take a little bit longer, but not much at all. Um, I think I'll also talk a little bit about the algorithms themselves. The, there's three different algorithms in outliers that can be turned on or off, depending on what you need. Uh, we have two of them engaged right now, but there's one which is um, called local outlier factor, which deals with uh, the density of transactions. So if you imagine a, a picture of plots of transactions, it sees if there are sort of clusters that group together um, and how far they are apart from each other. Uh, and then we have another algorithm called isolation forest, which is kind of like, um, it looks at, imagine that it's transactions off the stem of a tree. So it, it looks for how far you can, um, the transaction is from the stem. So it's, it's interesting, totally different ways of doing it. Uh, and it uses both at the same time. So what might not trigger in one could trigger in the other one. Okay, so let's look at this one now. So it is found, okay, 96%. Uh, are, seem okay. Uh, all right. So we have uh, data integrity unusual. So it found something here that's unusual. Let's see what it found. So it says the person GUI W, a lot of them. Uh, let's look at the, at the, let's look over here. So it's saying the outlier reason is this poster and this supplier are trouble. All right. So let's take a look. So what you can do is it'll actually give you a view where you can drill down to look at Mondesa development. So if we want to look at Mondesa development, I can go into 
the breakdown and I can search on supplier. And let's look at Mandesa and see what is the deal with Mandesa. Mandesa is here. You can see they're all posted by one person and they're all authorized by this person. And if you look at them, they are all, if I drill down, they're all exactly the same amount. Okay, this is very, very strange. What is this? Is this some sort of subscription? Is this sort of multiple payments? They're all only by this one person. So big red flag. That's why this has a, an outlier score of two. So there's two algorithms. They both thought this was very fishy. So I would definitely hit save and basically to be investigated. You're definitely going to say there's a something you need to look into there, right? So now you can, I'll just flag that transaction. Say these are to be investigated later. Uh, and so forth. You go through the list. Here are some other ones, for instance. Unusual. Okay, so let's see what these unusual about these ones. Oh, they look at this one. Posted by you, you authorized by what? No one. Let's see. Yep, that's what it found. Authorizer, no one. It has a problem with that because it looks at the data and it uses the data itself to train itself to know that authorizers shouldn't be zero or shouldn't be blank. There should be something in this field. That's normal for this for this database. There ought to be an authorizer when it doesn't see one. And again, you'll notice we didn't have to program anything. We didn't have to, to tell it, by the way, look for authorizers, see if it's empty. It just figured it out. Now that, of course, assumes that your data is more right than wrong, right? If you have data which is all 100% corrupt, it's going to be, it's going to think that's normal. Um, so your data should be in reasonably good shape as far as uh, the system's controls generally appear to be working, then machine learning can do wonders for you. And of course, there's many others. Uh, and you can, again, drill down. Uh, here's one I found where the posted by and the authorizer was the same person, right? Uh, there's many options that it'll find in this list. And what's nice is that you can then just go to the summary and you can drill down. Let me just uh, not sort it, but you can go into the summary and it's all drilled down for you. So you could say uh, a particular person, uh, what do they tend to approve, right? You can see Mia does many different types of transactions. Other people only do some transactions, right? You, 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 you can see this one as a, as a blank one and so forth. So this will, will hopefully give you uh, an idea of how this all works. So I think that probably covers, uh, we have, we could do one more example um, with a general ledger. Um, should maybe we can just get a, another one in with general ledger. Any any problem with that? We just do one more, um, Tipji. Sure, absolutely, please go ahead. I think, okay. uh, please go ahead, Jeff. I think if another five minutes, 10 minutes, no issues at all. Yeah, okay, that's great, that's great. Please. So. Uh, so we have a general ledger file. And just to show you that this this type of algorithm you can really use on any kind of data you want. Um, so here we're looking at, so let's see what we'll be interested in for this particular file. Okay, so what have we got? So we've got a count number. We got, of course, the count description. That'd be interesting. Uh, we'd have a user and the account and the amount. Maybe we'll do that. All right. So we'll do account description. And we'll have the user. Or where is the user here? So those are the categories we're interested in. And, um, and maybe the description, eh, I will take this, I guess it's fine. And we'll do an amount as numeric. Again, you can do this and redo it and try different things as, as much as you want. We'll do a level one scan and we'll just see what comes up. So again, um, it does, it, it's not instant because it is running multiple algorithms on the data at the same time. And it also has that, um, um, that reason code, which we've been looking at. Now the reason code does add some processing time. Um, so if you have a really, really large file and may not need the reason code, you can actually disable it in the advanced settings. Oh, see, these files are okay. But if you had a really large, like uh, this one, I think right now goes up to a million records. Um, so, but you know, if you're putting in 500,000 records, it's gonna take longer than a few seconds, of course. So let's have a look. Okay, so we found this one. It said there was a problem with this one. Let's see why that is. So we have a transaction. It's called printing is the account description. PH11 is doing it. And we're saying printing is an unusual transaction. Okay. I don't know why that is, but maybe we'll have a look. Let's just have a look. Let's see where printing is. And it turns out 
Oops, sorry, like that. Printing, it turns out there's only one line in the entire database for printing. So when it looks at an entire database and it says there is only one transaction in the entire file with printing, that's unusual, right? So I think that's a fair assessment, is that do we only have one of these a month? Uh, doesn't seem like much. It may be not a problem, right? Uh, there's no guarantee that printing is, is a problem, but it sees one, and most transactions have more than one line, right? So, uh, so and also it's a fairly large amount. Ah, actually it's not that large. It's, it's larger than many of the amounts, I guess. Uh, and so forth. You can go on these different, uh, there's other categories of lower limit exceptions, of course, if you have an amount or amounts that are off. Oh, here's one. A clearing account of minus 50,000. Okay, I think that makes sense. You know, we should, this person, DA4, has made a very large journal entry. Uh, we should know what that's about, make sure that this was done correctly. I think that's reasonable. Um, and so forth. But it can find things that you're not necessarily imagining. Um, and where well, you don't have to be writing. So we can see this particular user is involved in these transactions. Let's see what the reason is here. It's just this particular user that it considered unusual compared to the rest of the file. So what it's doing is it's using the file itself uh, for its training purposes. Um, so I think that wraps it up for my demo. Um, I am ready to take some questions here on this. Uh, I, I would request everybody to put in their questions in the chat box and Jairam will take them in sequence and they will be answered by Jeff, please. Thank you, uh, Deepji. And uh, Jeff, thank you for that insightful presentation. Uh, I am going to go through a couple of questions by order placed in the chat box. Uh, there is a question which has come in from Rajesh Shakote. How do we download the outlier app from the idea lab? Okay. Uh, so idea lab in, in idea 11, um, which uh, now Sama uh, of our, our Deepji. Um, so for idea 11 in India, wh where does that look like as far as rollout? No, I think we have already all maintained clients have got, they can graduate to 11.1. .1. That's not an issue. Great. So I think they can uh, they can download the app from Idea Lab. Great. So I'll show you what that looks like. Basically, you go to Idea Lab, you're going to have um, this button, and it automatically, if you when you're a supported uh, maintenance um, Idea client, you can start to go into that, and you can see look at different functions that you can download. Pandas profiling. There's all kinds of really cool machine learning stuff um, that you can uh, go for and you just click download you can learn more about it and you can download and uh, yeah you can basically um, start right there great uh, the next other... question Jeff yeah the next question Jeff is in the very first example you gave us on payroll mm -hmm. uh, there's a question from Kanak how do we get the minimum wage for any location does it require an import of data into idea right that's a very good question so in this example we are just using uh, general outliers functionality where it will find values that are too small and values that are too large so you would have to look at the ones that when it says um, lower limit exception you would have to look at those and see if any of them are too small but what you could do is if you did have for each jurisdiction you had a minimum you could join um, those transactions. So you would say uh, wherever, you could add that as a column before you do the work, and then you'd be able to very quickly say, if this field is less than the, the minimum, uh, then it's a guaranteed outlier. So uh, so you, you could do that outside uh, and bring it in. Well, as long as that, that territory um, is linked to your minimums, you could do it that way. But in this example, because you, we, we selected a level one scan, it, it casts the net very tightly, like it doesn't include lots and lots of outliers. It just says the very furthest, the very worst outliers only get picked up. The, the, if the higher you go in the level, if you say level three, level four, level five, you get a lot more outliers. Because think about it, what, what the algorithm is doing is, you imagine you have this, uh, this picture frame with a bunch of dots with transactions all over it. 
what it's doing is it's basically drawing a line around transactions and some of the ones that are furthest from the rest the ones that are on the outside of the line they're considered outliers and the ones that are sort of inside are considered inliers so where it draws that line all depends on how it trains itself on the rest of the data and the level of scan that you set so uh no so the, the quick question or the quick answer is um uh, we we don't have those regional settings but if you had the code you could join it and you would be able to do that fairly easily okay thank you jeff uh jeff uh, satish has uh he would like your view on a important matter he says in a typical organization knowledge transfer on analytics is poor and this leads to silos of knowledge where there's a lot of reliance on a few expert staff members uh, so will ai help break these silos yeah that's a really good question um i would say it depends on how ai is implemented um I would say AI right now still tends to be the domain of experts, and it's wrong um, because it's for everyone. And and what we tempted to do with outliers is try to democratize AI. That's why we created a field called outlier reason, because when we started on this journey, that does not exist. You have to create a special function to be able to try to explain why is it an outlier. And uh, and we had a lot of uh, data science people. They said that can't be done, uh, and they love looking at the numbers and they're looking at all. Uh, if you look at idea as well, we have the stats that they calculate uh, the 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 ratios and the ensemble scores and all that stuff. But we we deliberately keep that from the user. Uh, it's there, you can find it, but we don't show that. All we show is summary. This is what you need to know about. You click, you drill down, you get the detail, and we give you an explanation why. That's not normal in data science today. In data science today, they have the, 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 the math people and the science people, and they get all these stats, and, and they want to sort of be in the middle. Um, so I think AI designed well is for everyone. Uh, but I agree, right now, they're kind of trying to keep it to themselves uh, to a large degree. And, and this is what we want to break down. We want to try to create AI that is as simple as running Benford's Law or simple as running random sample. Right. That this is how simple AI should be, but it isn't in many organizations. So to answer your question, I would say the right AI is a, is a tool for everyone. Um, if, if you find that, that people are making something and trying to become indispensable and hoarding knowledge, um, th that's, that's the wrong approach. Then you probably have the wrong AI in your shop because it should be effortless for anyone to use. But yeah, it'll take time. It'll take time uh, for that to happen. But we've noticed okay. that as well. Thank, thank you, Jeff. Jeff, a uh, couple of more questions. There's a question from Santoshi. Uh, mm -hmm. What does the column outlier description denote in every example? Right. So let me just pull it up so we can have a look at it. So uh, this one here, this column we're looking at here, right? Outlier description. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what it is is because when you run through the um, all the transactions, Based on the level, normally we did level one scans, which gives you very few outliers. Um, it will give you a breakdown of the normal transactions, the ones that are inliers, the ones you don't have to worry about, and the ones that look like outliers. So this gives you a summary page, a breakdown uh, in risk order. First, it shows you all the, 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 no, the non-problems, the normal transactions, the, the inliers, and then in highest risk, and it goes down the page. So outliers two means that there were two uh, algorithms because remember I talked about, uh, let me just show you that page very quickly. I didn't uh, do a lot on this page, but this one, sorry, here. Um, outlier supports three different methods of finding outliers. They're all baked into the tool and you can turn them on or off if you like, uh, but they all have different approaches. Density-based approach, um, basically, uh, like the tree stem approach, and this is a hyperplane, 3D hyperplane approach. They're all totally different ways of finding outliers. But when you use them together, you find anything because they're all very different. But when you put them together, nothing really escapes. So this summary page, if this shows outliers three, it means all three 
of these, this was a problem for, for LOF, it was a problem for this, and it was a problem for that. So we consider that higher risk. So in other words, everyone thought this was an outlier. So this is top priority. Also, this type of transaction, everyone thought this was a problem. But this one, only one of the algorithms. So maybe this one thought it was a problem. This one didn't see anything. This one didn't see anything. So it's kind of in risk order. Does that make sense? Yep, sure. That's nice. Uh, okay. Jeff, Rajesh has a question. The algorithms which we are using within the idea lab and idea machine learning, are these proprietary algorithms of caseware or are some of them, you know, generic algorithms available in the world, like the LUN algorithm, for example? So Great. that's his question. Yes. Um, the good news is they are all available. Uh, they are publicly, um, they're peer reviewed uh, and they are publicly known, these algorithms. They've been around a long time, these algorithms Excellent. actually. They're, they're not new. Um, so we do that on purpose because we want to make sure that. If an auditor needs to prove uh, that it's not hocus pocus what they're doing, a client could say, I, I have a problem with you saying I'm an outlier or that this is a problem. You could say, this is just commonly known math. Talk to any data science person. Uh, they know these algorithms work. Okay, great. And do we have these algorithms listed anywhere in terms of like a help menu that the kind of algorithms which are being used? Uh, um, there are there is help like the oh, I'm not oh yeah I'm not in there now um, but there is help in the uh, tool itself and there is also a little tutorial video uh, on Idea Lab itself so when you click on the Outliers download there is a video that shows you how to use it um, okay so we have a bit but I would suggest you you could do a search in Google for local outlier factor and you will get all the information you want. Like it's an amazing amount of, of knowledge. So yeah, you can Perfect. easily find out. This is very high level descriptions. If you want to know details, there's more than you can imagine. Excellent. I'm going to go through a few more questions very quickly. Chirag okay. has a question. If we run the outlier test on the same data, on similar data over and over again, uh, does the uh, outlier get more intelligent? Does it kind of self-enrich or do we need to execute certain commands to enrich it? Yeah, so we're using unsupervised machine learning. So unsupervised machine learning does not learn, right? It, that is how that works. Supervised machine learning, and it's actually not that much harder. Uh, we're looking at, at adding supervised machine learning down the road, but in reality, we just find that um, if you're an auditor and you have two weeks to perform an audit, you don't have the time. Like no one has the time to go in and, and check and to say which ones worked, which ones didn't. What we do instead is we run the file and we start with the level one scan and we look at the, the quality of the results we're getting, whether they all seem legit. If they do, we go deeper, we run a level two scan, we get more. And then we reach a point where we can say, now nah, we're starting to get some that don't really look like outliers. They're mm, on the fence. Then we just stop. So we, we continue, we go deeper until we start getting results that are uh, on the fence, that are not clearly outliers. And that's how okay. we get around that issue. Okay. Uh, is it okay if we take one more question? The yeah, of course. Time -wise, uh... Yes, please. Last question, no problem. All right. Okay, and uh, the other questions we will definitely reply to you all uh, yeah. once the session is done. Uh, the last question from Uday. Uh, the database, does it need to be an SAP database or can we work with data from Excel or any other type of data as far as the outlier test goes? Right, so uh, you need IDEA installed uh, and as long as you import the data into IDEA, it doesn't matter what the original source is. It could be uh, Excel, it could be SAP, it could even be um, a print report. If you had a PDF that you bring in using report reader, as long as you have imported it and you you have an idea database, an actual database, an idea like, you know, you have a database like here are your transactions, it doesn't matter if it came from Excel or any other source. Uh, you can use it for any kind of data. Great, Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Divji, over to you. Thank you. Jeff, thank you very much for this simple presentation of a very complex topic. I think more and more auditors will be using artificial intelligence audit apps in the coming months and years. And I think idea has made it very simple. And your presentation was very simple, though it is such a complex topic. So thanks once again, and thank you 
for getting up early in the morning to be with us and to make this presentation. Oh, thanks for having me. It's always a pleasure to work with Sama. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thanks a lot.